um, works at UAMS Kids First as the administrator for outreach programs. She is in the health profession and is just an amazing advocate uh, for all things health and young children. And I just appreciate her uh, leadership and guidance. So Sandra, we'd love for you to talk. Um, I know you've been on the sidelines and on the front lines throughout this and really wanna hear from you and share with our colleagues. And then we'll open it up, gang. I know people will start putting some things in the chat. So please feel free to do that. But I'd like for Sandra to be able to make some comments about the importance of all of the things we're, that we're doing during COVID to keep children and families safe and our staff. Well, thanks, Tanya. I, I really appreciate the chance to, to visit just a little bit. And it looks like our winter sun has just hit me right in the eye. So let me move just a little bit. Um, getting used to the sun being a little bit lower and the temperature is also being a little bit lower. I hope you got, everybody's got your kiddos outside. Uh, if you haven't already, um, uh, surely they will be. Um, we're always big proponents of, of outdoor play, but uh, this uh, in the time of, of what we're dealing with right now, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Like Tanya said, I am so incredibly impressed with all the work that everybody's doing. Everybody's got a piece of the puzzle, right? We can't do this each all, all by ourselves. So the health department and the division, your child care licensing folks giving you advice, um, Ashlyn and all the folks that are um, working, um, helping work the hotline, um, giving you a, a, advice for when you're kiddos are sick or when you got uh, to figure out how to how to proceed when you've got exposure. So it's it's a lot to deal with, right? And things keep changing and we have to adapt to that. So one of the things that I think that I wanted to focus on today is when we're feeling overwhelmed with everything that we have to do, the job that you do isn't easy on a normal day, right? So I don't think that's fully appreciated by most people, that they don't really understand that this is not like the t-shirt keeping tiny humans alive. It's a lot more than keeping tiny humans alive. So the scope of all the things that you have to do is much, much broader than that. And so what I wanted to do is bring a, just a little bit of a focus to that so that you can prioritize some of the things that you do and um, uh, it maybe uh, make sure that you we're, we're following best practice. The one of the biggest things that I have been concerned about lately, and I'll just um, mention it just briefly, and that is our information and where we get it. So um, I know that you guys are following the, uh, you know, you're going to the division website, you're going to the health department website, um, for those of you who follow the uh, Department of Ed, um, you have to follow those guidelines. Um, so you follow all of those things. I wanted to also, um, and I think I can, I can share my screen, right, Ashlyn? We can make that happen. Can we make that happen? Yes, just wait. And I wanted to show you another um, resource in case you have not... If you haven't seen the um, Arkansas Center for um, Health Improvement, um, I think Ashlyn will share the, um, uh, the site with you. Okay. And Sandra, let me go ahead and say you should have the power now to share your screen. And also the information is in the chat box too. Okay. So share screen. Okay, can you see it? Okay, you're muted, Ashlyn, but I think you said yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. All righty, so um, the Arkansas Center for um, uh, Health Improvement is um, supported by the Department of Health, by Children's Hospital, by UAMS, by Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield. And what they do is they pull together a lot of the information um, that the health department has and puts it in a little different format. So it's the same information. And I don't know about you guys, but um, sometimes when things are happening far away from me, it's not really real. And so what this does is it gives you the chance to see what's going on in your own community. 
Now what I've got pulled up right now, I think I've got it by zip code. And, uh, but I can also pull it up by school district and I can see what the rates are in, in the school district that, um, that I've been. And one of the other misconceptions I think that sometimes people have is that this is something that's just in central Arkansas and um, in Northwest Arkansas and maybe in Pine Bluff. But if you see all of the red there, where is all of the red? So the highest rates right now are over in the Walnut Ridge area, in the Mammoth Spring area, over around Jasper, uh, and then over in the eastern part of the state. So right now, those are, are school districts that have a lot of, of infection, a lot of community spread. We hear that term a lot, right? So the other thing that you can do, which is, you know, I check this once in a while, kind of see, get my bearings, the other thing that I can do that is really helpful, you look at it by community, and you can look up your town. So not only can you look up your town, but let me see if I can get this down here. Okay, so I can move this down and see, let me just kind of look at, um, I can look, kind of look at the progression. So up here, it tells you the rate of infection. And, and in general, you know, the redder it gets, the more infection. And it also tells you by date. So starting back in August, we can look at this, uh, at, uh, this town of Beach Grove. I don't know where that particular place is, but you can say their rate was up uh, at 30 to 49 per 10,000. It stayed there for a couple of weeks. It got much better. Now it's creeping back up. So you can, as I said, you can kind of see, I'm gonna fly, kind of fly through here. It's a little harder to do. Okay, Berryville. Berryville was doing really well. Um, they began to get some more infections, more. Last week, uh, the 21st, it got uh, higher than 50. For 10, uh, 10,000. Now we're starting to go back down again. So you can pull up your town and you can look to see how it's done through over the last um, five weeks. They update this once a week. Um, so I think this is a really, um, really nice thing to, uh, uh, to take a look at. Okay, so I'm going to close that out. I'm going to stop the share. And kind of just go back to talking. So again, everybody's got a piece of the puzzle. We've got to see what the community spread is in our area, kind of heighten our, our uh, level of concern. But one of the, the baseline things that I want to, to emphasize is that we really do need to respect this virus. We are going to, um, to make sure that we continue to do what we need to do. We're gonna live with it. Uh, we're going to take care of our children, but we also have to do the things to stop the, uh, to make sure that we stop the, um, the spread. <clears throat> so one of the things that we uh, can do is focus on our priorities. So we know how the, uh, the virus is spread more than we did back in the beginning. Viruses spread person to person. It is in the droplets that come out of our mouth. I know you've heard that a bazillion times, but I think that's important for us to think about when we are going about our day. So this mask, mask here, is to catch, catch the virus. It's to catch it. It's to keep it from going out to other people. Um, this is uh, the way we keep the virus from spreading more than um, anything else when we're close to people. Ideally, we're far enough apart that the virus can't reach from me to that other person. But if we're close, this mask is the key. This is what we have to have to catch the virus. 
we know that 40 to 50 percent it's a new virus right we don't know how much that percentage is going to be months from now but after we have studied it longer and longer but at this point 40 50 percent don't have any symptoms or they're they're pre-symptomatic they are infectious but they haven't come down with symptoms yet so if we don't have this mask on to catch to catch the virus then we will spread it among all of our kids our co-workers and then that's when you have to deal with the exclusion and isolation and kids are out and uh, uh, your staff is out so this and physical separation are, are the, the two biggies. Now, a little bit about masks. Um, it needs to be comfortable. Uh, when, when all of our masks came out, uh, we had all kinds of fancy you know, sequins and all, all kinds of cool things. That's fine if it's got three layers and it's comfortable enough that you can wear it all day. But if you've got a cute mask that's itchy, and stiff and bugs you, you're gonna be tempted to do this. The virus lives in your nose. It lives in your uh, oral pharynx back at the back. And it lives in your nose. If you are wearing it like this, you're just breathing the virus out if you have it. So again, that's one of the things that I will emphasize as much as possible is, if you are close to other people, you have to wear a mask to keep from spreading the virus if you don't have symptoms or if you uh, uh, are pre-symptomatic. Pre uh, lots of different types of, of masks are, are fine. The cloth masks are fine. This one is, uh, I got this off Amazon. It is uh, because I, I wouldn't dare wear a, a surgical mask at work because those are reserved for our, our healthcare people. Those are fine. I've got a, I've got a cloth mask, uh, which is again, awfully, it's fine. I um, have invested in this very cheap and some people have done this to, um, to insert in my mask. It keeps the mask away from my face. You can talk easier that way. You can breathe that you don't have that damp mask up against your face. For some people, um, that has been really helpful. So again, it's got to be comfortable enough that you put it on, you leave it on, you don't touch it, um, and you're not fiddling with it, you know, fiddling with it all day. Things that are not okay, the bandanas, not okay. Uh, the neck gaiters that for some reason guys love, those are not okay. They, they don't filter, um, I mean, they don't protect um, other people that are around them. Those neck gaiters um, allow uh, the virus to, to just move back and forth. Uh, so those are, are, are pretty much useless. The other um, thing that I think that we will begin to see a little bit more is uh, the, old, the older children of our age range beginning to um, teach them about um, wearing masks when they are out in public. Um, I've got a five-year-old grandson. He has been wearing a mask since before his birthday. Um, and he's proud of that. That's something that he gets to wear his mask just like his older siblings do. It's not a bad thing. Kids, uh, although they have not tended to be sick with the virus, it's very mild in them. We work in early childhood, we're familiar with that, right? There's a lots of things that little kids get and handle fine. If we get it, we're sick as a dog, right? So if little kids get chicken pox, not, not usually a big deal. If we get chicken pox, we're very, very sick. So it's, it seems to be that that's the sim, uh, similar with coronavirus. The, the children handle it very well, but they can spread it. So, um, that's something that, again, as, as the children get older, um, that's another thing that can, can be added in. Another thing uh, that we can do is uh, distance. We, that's why the cohort is so important, keeping the same children together all day as much as possible, keeping the same adults together uh, as much as possible. The more mixing that you have, 
between rooms and between adults, uh, the um, more chance there is of spread. I mentioned outdoor play. For heaven's sakes, this is the time to get kids outside. We have definitely seen that the virus is far less likely to spread outdoors than it is inside. If it's inside, the air is still, there's not ventilation, then we breathe and rebreathe um, the virus uh, within the um, uh, within the rooms. So another, you know, a good idea. We're going out to to play outside. Let's open the windows. Let's air out the room. Um, it's the viral load, or, or that is one factor. The viral load. The more virus you get, the dose, if if you will, that's the more likely that you're going to get sick from this. So we want to decrease the viral load. We want to wear our mask to keep not very much virus going out into the room. We want to keep far apart so we're not breathing the same air. We want to open the windows so the air is moving through. Um, and then further down is the, the, the surfaces. It isn't as easy to catch the virus from a surface or from, from objects as it is person to person. Now that doesn't mean that we don't sanitize, we do. We have to disinfect, we absolutely have to do that. But if I'm going around sanitizing with my mask down here, then I'm breathing the virus onto the thing I'm trying to clean, okay? So you need your mask on when you're doing the disinfecting. You also don't need to tag team with another person close by. I mean, if, if you're working together, you, need to, you still need to have that separation. So um, again, the, knowing how the virus seems to spread or the most likely way that you're gonna get it helps you to manage your activities. Um, hand washing, um, you would think that it, you know, I hate to even mention it because it's such a boring topic. We do it all the time. We've got to do it for 20 seconds. That 20 seconds is the longest 20 seconds of our day because <laughs> it takes forever. But I also want to remind you and here in this mirror image, remember that you got to get all the surfaces, okay? So you got to get down here, right? Bec uh, things that you touch. You got to get this front part, this part of your hand, you got to get your fingernails, so you got to scrub your palm, and you got to get your thumbs. You got to you got to get all parts of your hand, because if you miss a spot and then again have to wipe a little nose or whatever, then uh, you know you, we're 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 spreading the spreading the virus that way. Um, so those are those are like the main things I really wanted to emphasize the masks, the separation of, uh, of folks, the, the um, hand washing, the ventilation, getting those kiddos outside. And then on top of all of that, while this happened, while the, when, the, when the virus hit and, and pediatric offices closed and um, our focus was elsewhere, while we weren't looking, our immunizations dropped off like a rock we missed 75,000 doses of, in, of uh, vaccines back at, the, at the, the worst of it, back in the late spring, early summer. We're catching up. The last I checked has been a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, but it was only up to missing 60,000. Now we don't want an outbreak of whooping cough. We don't want an outbreak of measles on top of everything else that you got to deal with right now. So uh, for sure, we want to get the, the kids immunized. And you'll say, well, I do that all the time. My kids are all caught up. That's great, and, and, and I uh, absolutely believe that. But your parents have other children, and you can be part of reminding them, you know, I know you've got um, a, a baby that you know, grandma keeps, she's not coming to, to the uh, facility. 
remind them we need really need to make sure to get all the kiddos um, up to date on their immunizations. Flu shots. If a lot of people have feelings about flu shots, they have strong feelings about flu shots, strong negative feelings about flu shots. We really, really want everybody to get their flu shot this year. We want every person over six months to get a flu shot this year. Every little bit helps in um, decreasing the load on our, on our clinics, on the hospitals. Um, so we, we really need for everybody to get their flu shot. And then the last, I, I would be uh, negligent if I didn't mention um, self-care for our staff. You know, we, we're concerned about the kids. I, I don't want any, any children to get the virus. Um, I don't want them to get the virus for themselves. I don't want to get the virus because I don't want them to give it to other people. But I am very worried about staff. I'm worried about adults. Um, the rate of serious illness in adults is much higher. Every decade, and I've got a few of them behind me now, I'm in a high risk category, but every decade is another pretty big jump in risk from the virus if, I, if you get it. Another big risk is obesity. We didn't know that back at the very beginning, this novel virus, remember? But now we know that obesity is a huge risk factor for getting serious um, illness with um, COVID. Um, and then as well as some of the other illnesses that uh, are disease conditions, um, like diabetes and heart conditions and kidney problems and things like that. So this is the time to take care of yourself if you're in a high risk category, you want to be, your technique should be exquisite. I mean, you should be very, very careful. Um, and it's the time where if you ever thought about not smoking, this is the time to quit. You know, don't smoke, get your disease. If you are diabetic, get your, get your diabetes under control. If you're on medications for high blood pressure or anything like that, you want to really maximize your um, treatment of, of what your uh, what you your health condition is. And then for all of the rest of us, we know that we get sick more when we're stressed more. It's a biological fact. So what you can do is make sure you eat right. Make sure you get some exercise. Get out there and run with the kids. You know, move with them. Um, uh, if you don't have a chance to do that, you know, take, you know, take walks after work, find a, a, a way to uh, have some stress relief in whatever way that, um, that fits you, because we've got to keep you healthy because you've got to take care of these kids so everybody can work. It's such an important job. And, um, and I really, I appreciate so much um, everything that you guys do. Um, it's going to be a little tough over, over for a lot longer than we want it to be. We're getting tired. We're getting tired of masks. We're getting tired of doing this, but we've got to hang in there a bit longer. Um, things are looking up. There's a lot of, of um, treatments that are coming down the pike. The vaccine is coming at some point. So, you know, there's, there will, we will be able to, uh, to get through this. But um, we've got to hang in there and be um, just kind of be strong for, for a bit longer. But I appreciate all of you. And Tonya, thank you. And, and Ashlyn, thank you for letting me just um, stand on my little soapbox again, just a little bit and, um, and remind folks of uh, a few things that we've got to keep on, keep on keeping on. So that's Thanks. really all that I had. Thanks, Sandra. We really appreciate you and you stay safe. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go to the chat box for a moment, folks. Um, Jay has posted that there is funding for deep cleaning. Remember, that is the one time that you have to have your invoices. So if you hire a company um, to come in and do that deep cleaning, save that invoice and you submit it to 
um, the email address in the chat box, it's, box, it's deepcleaning at dhs.arkansas.gov. Um, if, I know there's a couple of questions about quarantining children and Jay has responded, you know, to be in touch with her, but if you have a positive case at your facility, I think folks that are on this call probably know this, but please report that to your licensing staff. Um, it, it, it's something that's in the pan pandemic requirements. Um, it is important that you report to health and to your licensing staff. It also helps us validate with the health department or for ourselves for that deep cleaning. Then we know that we had a case back here that was positive and we get your invoice and it's all validated. So that's part of the reason that you have to report it to your licensing staff. So for any of you who have had a positive case, and by the way, five of the staff that work here at the Division of Child Care are staffing the call center at the health department. Many times they know they've taken a call and are aware that you've had a positive case at your facility. So those are all ways for us to verify for that deep cleaning and invoice. And it, I will tell you, we are already getting audited by two different organizations for the CARES funding. Um, so it's a very serious kind of thing and we take it serious. It's the one I tried to get funding to you um, with regard to the purchasing sanitation and cleaning supplies, but this is the one part of it that you have to have an invoice for and we require that. And I appreciate all of you who have submitted your invoices and we've been able to pay, um, but get your invoices to us. We will validate that. Please now, I know that folks are saying we have, we need something from the health department. Just so my staff know, the health department is very busy. We will work to validate that, report it to your licensing staff. That's part of the validation as well. But we will work with health. You don't have to call them. They do not have time to be answering more calls. So I just, for my staff, please do not advise programs unless they're calling the call center and needing help. We just can't keep bothering them for uh, pieces of paper to document. So I just wanna make sure everybody knows that. We will work with you to validate your deep cleaning, but please submit your invoices to the deep cleaning in the chat box. Um, I, I saw a note, um, Sandra, about a short video on hand washing. I think that's a great idea. We will work with folks. Maybe there's something already out there and if we can get something, we'll put it out as a link um, on the website and uh, make sure we update you guys on our next call, uh, but I'll bet we can find something and I think that's a great idea. Um, I will tell you here at DHS, we have songs posted in the bathroom that you sing while you're hand washing. So um, think about songs that you might be able to sing for 20 seconds or more <laughs> and teach the children songs. It's a great way to transition them into that um, in a fun way uh, during a stressful time. I saw a couple of notices about struggling with hiring good staff. I wish I had a really good answer for that. Um, I think there are lots of folks on this call. I would say um, work as an early childhood network. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're out there on your own. Call your colleagues in your community. There are programs that are not opening and there might be people who would like to work that work in those programs that have background checks. Uh, those are just some suggestions, but um, don't be alone out there um, if you're struggling with that. I appreciate that. I think the biggest concern I see in that is there are folks that are having to make decisions about how many children to serve and they may have to disenroll children. And that's certainly a big concern when everybody's trying to get back to work. So um, if we hear some good ideas, we will let you guys know. But I think as a team, if any of you have have some ideas about that for the colleague that's having that issue and I see several that have posted on that one. Please put your comments in the chat box so that others can learn from that and licensing staff if you're hearing anything out in the field about that um, please put that in the chat box or work with our providers to help them network um, because I can only imagine I know it's difficult here in state government but I can only imagine out in the field when you're trying to meet ratios and keep children safe that it, it becomes a real challenging situation. Um, I'm going to move down. Lots of thank yous to you, Sandra. Um, I'm glad I was going to go to background checks, so I'm glad we already got there. Um, so I'm going to let Ashlyn come. Up. We are, as, as many of you know, this has been a transitional period during COVID. It's kind of a, an interesting time to simultaneously implement an automated background check system. Um, and it certainly has had some hiccups. 
Um, but I, I do want to make sure folks are aware that there is some delay um, at State Police. We are working with the other agency. I know that my boss talked with um, Lindsey Williams yesterday. So I know they're trying to work and make sure they're appropriately staffed, but there is, there's some lag time from that. But we also have seen, and I'd like for Ashlyn to talk about this, we do have providers that are get, getting the wrong forms. And as we go forward, we won't be able to continue to process with the wrong form. So let's talk. And I see a few of you chatting back and forth and I appreciate that. Thanks to all of you who are putting notes in about how you're working with those. But Ashlyn, any updates or comments about uh, criminal background checks? Yes, ma'am. You hit a lot of the highlights that does seem to be um, an explanation for why some of them are running behind. Um, and the people are trying to work together with the state police in terms of getting um, things processed. So it could be a delay on our part, you guys, and it could be a delay on the Arkansas State Police. We are experiencing a lot of the same struggles you guys are in terms of, you know, we have also employees that need a quarantine or that are out for at risk. So it's just, I, I loved what Sandra said, we're all having to work together and background is not any different in terms of trying to get them processed. So the first question I say I see in here is that several of the employees say that the FBI complete, but the overall check is still provisional and it's been several weeks, who should I contact? Um, always for the background check questions, you can check with your licensing specialist and then Nora, who's been on our call, many of our calls, if not all of them, um, is the program manager for the background check unit you can reach out to her or her team. We are working through uh, the structure of her team, so she might refer you to someone else on there. Um, Nora, if you're on the call, if you will put your information in or whomever you want to direct those questions to. But guys, what's gonna happen is they can check it for you and see what the status is, um, but chances are there might be some piece of the criminal background check, the FBI or the central registry that is still needed. So here's the common reasons why, um, outside of just us needing to work through it, some common things that we are seeing that you guys can absolutely help with. So Tanya mentioned one of them, which was the consent form. So whereas in the past, you guys would send in a consent form for the Arkansas criminal check, and then you would send in a consent form for the FBI, now you're only sending in one form. So if you will go to the Arkansas DHS background check website, and you can get there by just Googling it. Uh, you can Google ARC DHS, click on the link for the Department of Human Services, and then in the up, upper right-hand corner, about two tabs down, you will see background check. In fact, if I can get there real quick, or I may do this in a minute, uh, Tanya, after I answer questions and you answer some more, um, I'll actually show you how to get there. But on the background check website, it has a hyperlink that says state criminal and federal background check. It's a blue hyperlink that you're looking for. That is the correct consent form. And you're going to have to have the correct consent form because we're past the October 1 deadline now. So you need to upload that consent form. And what a lot of people were a little confused about is okay, here, they filled out the form oh. and they were thinking that once they filled out the form, that's all they had to do. And that is not right. When you fill out the form, it's just the form generator. So think of it like that. It's a form generator so that you can type all your information in and it, you will print out that form. It'll send you an email saying, here's your form. You'll go to your email, you'll print out that form. The form is needed when you enter the background check request, um, you will upload it. So a lot of what we're seeing is there's just missing forms. If my team and Nora's team, if we don't have the consent form, we don't have the permission to run the check and we have to have that from the person that you are requesting. So that's one thing. The other thing that the Information Network of Arkansas, or INA, is we're learning, we're learning. Um, INA has provided us some feedback that a lot of people 
are putting an incorrect birth date for the applicant. And I think what is happening, you guys, is we're just hurrying and we see a date and we just naturally put 2020, the year 2020, and that's what's happening a lot of times. So my birthday is April 10, and so I would have entered April 10, 2020. The thing about that is once you, you enter the information for the applicant or the employee, the very next screen, you guys, is your verification screen. So like if you're shopping on Amazon or doing any kind of online ordering, you know how that screen will pop up and it'll say, are you sure this is what you want to order? Is all this information correct? It's the same thing on the online system for the background checks. So when you get that verification screen, make sure that you're really slowing down long enough to look at it to make sure that all of the information is correct because that's delaying some of the criminal background checks. And then the other thing to answer, I see a, another question under there. Another thing um, that we have to have before we can give you the overall approved status is the central registry. We have to have the information from the central registry. And so what providers or some providers are doing, and it kind of makes sense in my head, like I can get in that headspace, they are going in and they're doing everything that they need to do on the INA system for the criminal and the FBI check, but they're delaying a few days uh, before they do the central registry because the central registry, as you guys know, goes straight up to DCFS now. There's that new address that goes straight up there. And so however many days drag time between when the provider entered it into the INA system and then mailed off the central registry to the uh, DCFS, that's additional days it's going to take to give that overall approval. So it's really good if you can to do all those criminal background checks and the central registry check at the same time so that it can go, the central registry can go ahead and start processing as well while we're processing the criminal and FBI down here. So if it's been a long time, um, and Randy, I see your question there, um, the, the really like September-ish, September or so, that one doesn't concern me as much as the August or back. If we have some that are longer than August or back and you haven't heard anything about it, then I would go ahead and check on those. And you again, you can do that. I haven't had a chance to scroll down. You again can do that by just reaching out to Nora and her team. Um, that's a great idea. Amanda was saying you guys check a deed indeed in, in terms of staffing. Um, should, should the status on background checks change from provisional to approved after paper child maltreatment checks are returned? So yes. That's exactly what I was just talking about. So right now, your criminal, your FBI will be um, electronic. The central registry or child maltreatment will be paper. The uh, team on the central registry sends that information down to uh, Nora's team. And then they, Nora's team is responsible for combining those together to give you the overall approved. So before you get the overall approved, all of those checks will be back. Now for you guys on this call, you can start an employee to work as soon as the Arkansas State Criminal Check comes back. So it is important to look at your account and to see the status of the people that you've submitted. If you have a provisional, that means that enough of the information has been processed here to allow that person to go to work. So if you've got a provisional, your person can go to work. Now, please remember that that is with supervision. The person has to be supervised until they get all their criminal records and their maltreatment back and you have it overall approved. Um, okay. Thank you, Candace, for putting in Nora's email address there. And let's see, I've got some final letters back and they list a provisional date and a final date. How do I know which date is the FBI state and which is the child maltreatment so we will know when they need to be renewed? 
Very good question. And we are in the process right now working with the developers to um, look at the potential of adding in dates so that we can know with certainty what date something was approved. I would think that what you need to do now on that one is your, let me think about that a second. For sure your letter with the uh, provisional date will be your Arkansas State Criminal and FBI, so, so that would help a little bit. The final date for the maltreatment, because I know you guys need to get that every two years. I would actually on that one, I think what I'm going to say here is to check with your licensing specialist right now. And the reason I say that licensing specialists who are on the call is because the maltreatment and providers, this is good for you to know too, the maltreatment system right now is being also updated and they're hoping to go um, automated very soon as well. And once that happens, then we'll know with surety that date. But in this in, in between time, I'm thinking that's probably gonna be the best way. And then licensing specialists, you can tag in with Nora's team um, to help make sure that the records are straight there. Um, somebody said there's a date on the maltreatment on the back of the form when it gets returned. That's very true. It does. There should be a stamp on there. Thank you, Amanda. I forgot about that. There should be a stamp on the back of that form that will uh, have a date on there. But if, it, if for some reason you can't find it or see it, then reach out to us and let us know. Um, well, Candace, sort of. So the state, the state is what's going to fire off the provisional um, for the providers. So in terms of criminal record checks, you know, the Arkansas State Criminal has to be back. So, and it's the one that is coming back the fastest. That's what's going to fire off that provisional status that you're going to see when you go into your account. But the FBI and the maltreatment have to come back before we get a final. Those have to be, that's what's going to kick off that approved status providers that you're going to see. So those two things have to work in concert together for the overall approved. How should we direct therapists about the FBI background check? So there, there is discussion going on about uh, therapists and right now they are still expected to do the same thing that we've done in the past where they are working with a licensed facility. So it'd be great, you guys, if you've got therapists that are coming in um, to provide service to children in your facilities, it would be great if you could work through um, that with them to run their background checks. Now, if you're on the call and you fall into the ABC program, um, there are some different nuances to that. And so I, I would just say to you guys about the therapist, let your licensing specialists know that the therapists are in there and then let's help sort out where they're coming from, if they're already connected to another entity. Um, but for now, our regulations do say that they will need background checks. Okay, Tanya, I think that I hit all the um, background check questions. Do you think it would be helpful for me to go ahead and pull up that site while you're visiting about uh, payment questions? I'm gonna, if you all would type in the chat box, that would be helpful. I don't wanna take up time with that. It's not going to be helpful for everyone. However, I was thinking, Ashley, maybe if we did a step-by-step narrative. I know we have it on the website that people can narratively look at, but if we actually videoed it and like step by step, this is what you do. Maybe we need to work with comms and that might be helpful. Some of us are more visual and just reading something may not get us there, but if you could also see that step by step. So we, we will work on that. I do want you all to be aware and, and Ashlyn alluded to this because there's been a lot of change to this as you all know and you know, automated is kind of an interesting word. You think, when I think automated, it's very efficient and we're finding this is not as efficient and automated here means that people have to review it in order to move it on. And so if there's no one that can even look at the email to move it on, then it gets hung up and it doesn't feel very automated that way. So, but for DCFS and for child maltreatment specifically, where that goes, 
our team is working on automating that portion that is currently not automated. It's not part of this automated as you all know, so you're having to mail that in still, but they are working on that and expect that to be done probably before the year is out or early in 2021. So we, we will be talking about it on this call as we get closer to that, but they're pretty close right now. So I just wanted you guys to know that. Um, Ashlyn posted in the chat box that there was a provider call with Kevin and he showed each step that's recorded. So there you go, gang. We've already done that for you. That was on the last call that Kevin Grace and Justin were on. I'd forgotten that we recorded it. So that might be helpful. Um, Lisa is letting us know for those who live in the border but work in Arkansas or have not lived out of state for the past five years, do they have out of state checks ran and results before an I run, I and I runs anything? So Ashley, this is an out of state person. I'm sorry, I was looking for that link. If, if there's a licensing specialist on that can check out our website and find a link to the recordings, that would be great. Um, I apologize, Tanya. It's um, the question. So this is, is for someone who lives across the border in Texas or Missouri. Yes. Okay. So if you are, thank you. I'm with you now. I apologize. Um, if you are hiring someone um, or have an applicant that lives out of state, you do have to to work with that applicant. It's the applicant's responsibility and uh, ultimately is their responsibility, but you're also responsible in that you're trying to hire them, but they need to be the one that would contact. So in the example of Texas, let's say, they would need to contact Texas and get their state of Texas criminal record check. They would also need to get the state of Texas central registry. Now, what we're finding in states, you guys, where we call it the Arkansas central registry for child maltreatment, different states have different names for it. And so it would be whatever the equivalent is. So what we're telling applicants is ask for that state's maltreatment. How do they log the maltreatment in their state? And so that is the information that we would need from that state. So that is if they have not lived in the state of Arkansas for five years, they have to live here. So that, was, that would be when it would apply. Um, and they can work. So Lisa, I think what you're saying, do they have to get those before, the results before INA runs anything? No, those things can run together. So please go ahead and start working through the Arkansas information, the Arkansas State Criminal FBI through our INA. Start working on that and get it going. And then also send in your central registry for the state of Arkansas. Get that going and then work with your applicant and or your employee um, to work from whatever state they were in prior to um, moving here for five years. By the way, it's wherever. So if you are if you are hiring somebody or want to hire somebody who's been in Oklahoma for two years, Texas for two years, and then went to New Mexico for one, it's whatever's happened in those last five years, all of those states would need to be contacted. And we need the state's criminal check and then that state's uh, registry. Does that help a little bit, Lisa? Okay. Okay, I see a question there, Tanya. I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump right in again. Um, if you've entered something incorrectly into the background check system, um, you will be notified. Um, generally speaking, if it is like something that's off that the system will catch, like the date one wasn't entered in the right format, um, or you know the document wasn't uploaded. The system should be catching those errors. Um, so the system itself will alert you, but if something was entered incorrectly um, and we can't process it, then we will be notifying you, which is some of the delay that's happening right now, you guys. Um, so Ashlyn, um, Michael Alsobrook from our team has posted the link that has the walkthrough, okay. Kevin Gray, so it's on there for you it's all. Really good, you guys. We got really yeah. good feedback on that. So. so make sure you capture that and post it, paste it someplace where you can go back to it if that's helpful for you and or your team who does um, that within your agency. Uh, Candace has... Um, put a note in that for those folks who do live out of state, 
that maltreatment is not running in those until they have the maltreatment from the other state. Well, I, I will clarify that, Candace, with the team. Um, I think what they're meaning there is that they cannot give you the overall approval. It, it's not that they're not checking the maltreatment here, but I will check because the maltreatment is handled outside of our division. So I'll check with those guys and see if that is truly what is happening. And I don't see anything else in the chat box. Um, so I, we're getting close to 11 o'clock. Thank you, Sandra Withers, for being with us and sharing and keeping us all focused on the importance of our health during this time. Um, thank you to all of you providers who are doing amazing work out there every day and keeping children safe. Just keep the work up continue to do that. Um, thank you to the staff in the Division of Child Care who are on and our contractors and partners who are doing training and who are also putting themselves on the front lines. We appreciate all your hard work. Thank, thanks to all of you. Just keep it up. We will have a call in two weeks. Um, and thank you, Ms. Jackson. We will put the call dates on the website. So I know I've got a couple of emails from folks who didn't see it for today, but um, we will, we do plan to have a call every two weeks. If we know in advance that we're not going to have it, we will announce that on the call. So everyone stay safe and we will talk to you next time. Bye you guys.